The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care. morning church i just want to say welcome to blank slate ministries if you are joining us for the very first time i'm so excited to have you with us today today we are going to have a powerful lesson we're going to be talking about the nature and character of god and it's really gonna it's really gonna bless you i i teach on this quite often here in brazil if you know we are a teaching ministry out of chicago illinois but we are currently in brazil doing missions and this is a message that we preach often, but it's really just trying to unveil the character of God. So that way you get a firm perspective in the word of God. So we're going to go back to the very beginning. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter three today to learn about the character of God. But before then, we just want to go through a couple quick announcements. Please follow our daily teachings Monday through Saturday at 9 a.m. Now, sometimes we take Saturday off. But usually it's Monday through Saturday at 9 a.m. for anywhere between 20 and 30 minutes. And I just encourage you to follow along with us there. We are in a series called End Time Prophecy, and we have done over 600 daily teachings currently and many different subjects, many different things. I just encourage you to go onto our website, go onto our YouTube channel and follow along and get all of the revelation of the word of God. And then I encourage you, number two, to take our discipleship curriculums. Our discipleship curriculums have so much information. There's so much revelation, but you can go ahead and go online. You can purchase their curriculum. You'll get an automatic link to go ahead and download the curriculum. And then you can take the class week by week. There's a lot of information on there. We are running a sale. We do have scholarship programs. There's just so much information on our YouTube channel and on our website. We have over 1,200 sermons uh, in the Word of God, so I just encourage you to continue to follow along with us. We are a teaching ministry. That's what we will continue to do, and I just encourage you to follow along with us. And then our last announcement is to partner. BlankSlateMinistries.org slash partnership. You can partner with us in your giving on a monthly reoccurring basis on our website. I encourage you to do that today and your giving is what is helping us advance the word of God across the world. Uh, I just love to thank God and thank our partners for your faithful giving. Uh, when you do missions specifically, you do receive from the people in the area that you were in, but we are a global ministry, so it requires a lot of money to take care of all the things that we do. And we have some amazing faithful partners that have came alongside of us and I just want to say thank God and thank you for your giving. I just want to read one verse today, and then we're going to receive the offering, and then we're going to jump right into the lesson. And I pray this lesson blesses you today. But Philippians chapter 4, verse 17, Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. 
I'm not going to teach fully on giving today. We have many lessons on Philippians chapter 4. But Philippians chapter 4 is a passage on partnership, people that come alongside the ministry in their giving. But Paul says this amazing phrase, It's one of our most quoted verses in the Word of God, not because I desire a gift. You know, Paul makes this radical statement. He says, your giving is for you to be blessed, but it's not because I'm desiring of you. I, like, I'm not trying to get your money so I can buy me a brand new car, or buy me a brand new house or do this or do. That's not it. See, you can't receive prosperity and the blessing of God unless you use the key of giving. It's the only way to access the prosperity of God. So you have to give if you want to receive. And we've talked about it before in 2 Corinthians 9 that you receive or you reap directly in proportion to how you give or how you sow. So if you're not sowing, you're not reaping. If you're not giving, you're not receiving. And the way in which and the proportion in which you receive is in relationship to how you give. What you give is how you will receive. There's a reason why we give in abundance because we believe we receive in abundance and we do both. But we understand this principle, but I want to just tell you again, we talk about giving not because we need your money, but we want to see you blessed of God. And the only way to do that is through giving. So we're going to give you an opportunity right now to give. So Father, I thank you for everybody that is giving today. Let them receive good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over men, giving into their bosom, hundredfold increase, windows of heaven open in their life. God, let them see prosperity in Jesus name. Amen and amen. You have one minute to give, and when you come back, we'll jump right into the lesson. And we're back. And I just want to say thank you again to everybody that is giving today. It's an honor to be able to receive. Today, we're going to take a special lesson. Uh, we're going to talk about the character of God, the nature of God. And I, I pray that you follow our daily teachings because yesterday we had a lesson entitled Mercy. And when you look at mercy and you look at Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. It's a powerful understanding on what God desires. You say, well, that's Hosea. Well, Jesus quoted that passage in reference to salvation, people getting born again, sinners coming to repentance. And even the apostle James said that mercy triumphs over judgment. You know, it is God's heart to release mercy into the earth and not only to release it in the earth, but that people would receive God's mercy and get born again because God desires his people. But what I want to do today is I want to take us back to the beginning. There is something that I've realized many, many years ago. The Lord spoke this to me about probably eight, nine years ago. The Lord spoke this to me. He said, if you don't understand the first three chapters of Genesis, you most likely will not understand the rest of the Bible. The understanding of who God is from Genesis chapter three, the third chapter of Genesis, if you don't understand God in that chapter, you most likely will not understand anything in the word of God. And even if you have some understanding, you're going to have a misperspective. You're going to have a misunderstanding of God himself, even if you understand some of the things. And this is what we see often. I'm just going to make this point. Well, let's pray. I'm going to read the verse and then we'll talk about it. Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion. 
transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus name. Amen and amen. Let's read the verse and then I'll then I'll talk. Uh, Genesis 3, 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel. I don't, I'm not going to go into all of Genesis 3. I do want to say you take our BSM discipleship curriculum. We go through Genesis 3 in complete detail, verse by verse. But I have many, many, many teachings on Genesis 3. Genesis 3 is one of my favorite chapters in the entire word of God. But what I want to do for just a moment is talk about God himself in Genesis 3. And, and, and something that's so important is understanding who God is. So let's just go ahead and say this point. The God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are not different people. Oh, this is powerful. God never changes. In Malachi chapter 3, I am the Lord, I change not. Hebrews 13, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is not a man in that he should lie. God always tells the truth. I mean, those are just a couple verses I pulled out. You can go and read those. It's Numbers 23, Malachi 3, Hebrews 13. I don't remember where I just quoted the other one from. But there's so many passages to understand who God is. God never changes. And it's, oh, God is light, James chapter 1. But what I want to say is just for a moment, that a lot of times, even in a church that believes in grace, in mercy, in the New Testament, in Jesus, even in most modern churches, they understand Jesus of the New Testament. He's the express image of the Father, Colossians chapter 1. So he is the image of God the Father. But what they believe is that New and Old Testament are different. I grew up in a Bible-believing church. And when I say I grew up, meaning when I got born again at 18 years old, I didn't actually grow up in the church in my life. I did starting when I was 18 years old, which is 10 years ago. But the, the thing, even in a church that believed in Jesus, believed in grace, talked about mercy, even believed in the Holy Ghost, power of God, miracles. Yet there was still a disconnect between God of the Old Testament and God of the New Testament. It was There was still this big disconnect in the church that they would see them as different. Now, the Father and the Son are different, yet the same. Three, uh, One God in three persons. They're different in persons, but they are the same God. And they are no contradiction between themselves. Jesus, as the Son in a physical body, is just a complete, perfect reflection of the Father. That's who He is. He is a perfect reflection of the Father. And that's very important to know because they're not different, yet they are completely the same. Now, here's something I want to just unpack for just a minute. A lot of times we understand mercy and grace because of Jesus, but we don't understand the Father. And because of that disconnect, we see a change in the Bible starting in the book of Matthew. They're different. That's what we think. Even though it's not true, there is no difference. But because of this, we really misunderstand God's character and God's nature. So we need to go back to the beginning. And Genesis chapter 1, God makes man. Genesis 2 is actually the story of the creation of man. And then Genesis 3 is the Garden of Eden. Now, I don't, I don't have time today to go through all of the little details in this. I just pray that you go and find all the other information we have. But Genesis chapter 3 is a powerful chapter in which man falls in rebellion against God. Man rebels, man falls into sin. But man falls separates themselves from God. God runs after them. Man confesses sin. And the very first thing God does in Genesis 3, 14, 14, not 15, but 14, is God judges the serpent. He curses the devil because of what he did to deceive man. It's the very first thing God does. Genesis 3, 15, which was the verse we just read, God prophesies the seed of the woman. Now, the seed of the woman is obviously Jesus. And Jesus will bruise the head of the serpent, and the serpent's head will bruise the heel of Jesus. Jesus will triumph over the devil. That's what's prophesied in Genesis 3.15. And the reason why that's so important is God 
prophesies redemption before God brings forth consequence of sin to man. Before there is actually a punishment, a judgment, a dis before there is ever a spoken consequence of sin to Adam and Eve, but she was technically woman, she wasn't Eve yet. But before there was a consequence of sin to Adam, you know, sweat of thy brow, all the days of thy, before that was the prophetic promise of Jesus. And that is so important to understand that before God ever judged man, God promised redemption to mankind by prophesying Jesus. And that, and, and that right there to me, if you don't understand that, you'll misunderstand the rest of the chapter. Because at the end, God says, lest they take of the tree of life and eat and live forever, we will put them out of the garden. Now, I just want to say a couple of things. Because of, I'm just going to say it, children's church and a lot of misunderstanding in the church as a whole today, we have misunderstood what took place at the end of Genesis 3. At the end of Genesis chapter 3, God puts man out of the garden. Man is cast out of the garden. God puts a cherubim or an angel with a flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life. That is true. Man is put out of the garden. But why man is put out of the garden is more important than what happened. See, we all agree man is put out of the garden. Obviously, we're not in the garden. We understand that. But the why behind the what is what is most important. And here's, here's what I mean by this. If you believe that God put man out of the garden because of anger and because of sin, you don't understand God and you don't know God. And, and, I, and that's a very bold statement. And, I, and I've heard a lot of, I've, I've had a lot of pushback before people. I know who God is, but you don't if that's what you believe. You say, well, why is that important? If you think God put man out, separated from man because of anger and because of man's sin, you think that every time you commit sin, God separates himself from you. And that's not true. See, we, we don't understand who did what in the story. See, when man sinned, God did not separate. Man separated from God. Man is the one who separated, not God. That's very important. It was man that chose to walk away from the Lord when they rebelled against God, not God. So God came after man, even though man was now in sin. You know, so God was always going after his people. I use the example all the time of Genesis chapter 18. 15 chapters later in the Bible, God and Abraham are at the tent door in the heat of the day. So God, fellowshipping with man, having a meal together after the Garden of Eden. I mean, that's just a perfect example of God still fellowships with man after the Garden. So it wasn't God who separated, it's man who separated from God. But before God judged man, God promised restoration to man. God prophesied his son before man was ever out of the garden. See, a lot of times we think about the Old Testament prophets as the one who spoke Jesus. They're not the ones who spoke him first. God spoke him first in Genesis chapter 3. God promised the reconciliation back to himself through the blood of his son in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden. You ready? When man was still in the garden. Man wasn't out of the garden. Man was standing right there with God in the Garden of Eden when God prophesied Jesus. I'm promising redemption back to me before I even judge you for your sin. What else happens in this story? After there's a consequence for sin, God kills an animal. How do you say, how do you know God killed an animal? Well, he clothed them with goats. You know, he clothed them with animal skin. How do you get the skin off an animal? You kill the animal. That's what you do. So God shed blood in the garden. How do you pay for sin? Through the shedding of blood. So God paid for that sin in the garden. 
So not only did God prophesy Jesus, God paid for that sin that they committed in the garden while they were still in the garden. See, all of these things took place still in the garden. You say, well, why is that so important? Why did God put them out of the garden? Geo, what's so important is there's so many different commentaries and people that say, this is the reason why God put them out of the garden. And all I want you to do, like I said, we're not going to read it. You can study it on your own. Is at the end of chapter three, God says, lest they take of the tree of life. This is why I'm putting you out of the garden. God answers the question in Genesis 3. You don't have to wonder why God did it. God said why God did it. So you wouldn't take of the tree of life. Now, here's the question. Here's where most people mess up. Why is that so important? What does that actually mean, protecting the tree of life? If you eat of the tree of life, you will live forever. If you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. So if you die, then you eat of the tree of life where you will live forever. You will live forever in death. Or better way to say it, you will live forever separated from God. Later in the book of Hebrews, it says it specifically that the reason that sin was paid for is through the blood of Jesus. The blood of bulls and goats cannot purify the conscience, but through the shedding of one man's blood one time forever, you can be reconciled back to God. Death had to reign in the earth. There's a reason why God let death reign in the earth. So his son could die. See, if there's no death in the earth, Jesus can't die. If everybody just grabs the tree and lives forever, nobody dies. Nobody has a sin paid for because Jesus can't die. There's a reason why death reigned in the earth. It's God's plan of redemption. That's why it rained for 4,000 years. To give the moment in time where Jesus would hang on the cross and say, it's finished. I'm God's sacrifice. I'm dying right now. And then he gave up the ghost. He paid the price so you could come back to the Father. See, the true nature and character of God is mercy in your life and reconciling you back to himself. He prophesied his son before he ever judged you. And when you begin to realize that, you'll start to understand who God is. Father, we thank you. Bless everybody in Jesus' name. We give you all the glory. Amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day. Like, follow, share, drop us a comment, and we will see you tomorrow. The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow. Oh, the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons. The drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. The sun's not working.